I want to ask all of us, all leaders of planet Earth, let us appreciate Earth. Let us treasure its life-sustaining gifts. Let us do everything within our means to preserve and protect planet Earth. It starts with all of us, leaders, to think and act correctly because our children's collective future depend on this one. The father of our country, our modern Papua New Guinea, the late, great Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare, was a champion in this regard. In fact, Sir Michael uh, champ uh, championed the cause of Article 5 of, uh, that has become uh, as finest place into Paris Agreement as I speak today, early in the year 2000s. This is a reflection of Papua New Guinea's strong affinity to the forest, land, and sea. In doing that, we will migrate from being just a raw resource exporter to a manufacturing economy within the next decade. Mr. President, despite our economic needs, PNG remains committed to safeguarding both our blue ocean life and our green forest life for its children. It is my honor to address this August House Hall once again on behalf of my people of Papua New Guinea. Mr. President, firstly, let me congratulate you, the government and people of Cameroon, on your successful election to lead the work of the 79th session of the General Assembly. I thank your predecessor, His Excellency Mr. Dennis Francis, for his excellent leadership during the 78th UN General Assembly. I also extend my gratitude to the United Nations Secretary General for his strong leadership to mobilize the support of the global community on key issues that require our collective efforts, especially in dealing with climate change related matters. Mr. President, you selected a theme for this debate, leaving no one behind, acting together for the advancement of peace, sustainable development, and human dignity for the present and future generations, I believe is very pertinent. I thank you and commend your foresight in drawing our collective attention to the work we must still do for peace and humanity, considering the vast challenges that continues to threaten our society and what we face today. Mr. President, I speak on three threats to humanity that is complementary to your theme. These threats, in my view, are religious intolerance, poverty induced by climate change, and geopolitical differences and sovereignty contests of our territories and people. And I will prefix this statement here with my country as a backdrop. Mr. President, Papua New Guinea is the world's most culturally and linguistically diverse nation, with over 830 languages in a myriad of sub-ethnicities and subcultures that are still authentically indigenous today as I speak. A real-time modern nation of a thousand tribes. And we embrace this diversity and do our utmost best to function as one people, one nation, and one country in our intention to leave no one behind. In terms of environment, Mr. President, my country hosts up to 7% of world's biodiversity, mostly housed within a tropical rainforest that is the third largest in the world and has a vast marine ecosystem. We sustainably manage our forest, land, and sea because our livelihood depends on them. Papua New Guinea, in a small way, teaches the world on how living in balance with nature, tolerating cultural diversities, and practicing environmental stewardship. The father of our country, our modern Papua New Guinea, the late great Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare, was a champion in this regard. In fact, Sir Michael uh, champ uh, championed the cause of Article 5 that has become uh, as finest place into Paris Agreement, as I speak today, early in the year 2000s. This is a reflection of Papua New Guinea's strong affinity to the forest, land, and sea. In this regard, my country has been contributing to the public or global discourse over the last two decades in as far as environmental management is concerned and matters relating to climate change. Unfortunately, this has been met with very little return of action. However, we continue to stand ready to assist the United Nations family in this area. Mr. President, over the last 49 years of our country's history as an independent nation, our challenges have been many, compounded by vast ethno-linguistic diversities and cultural complexities and a small size of our economy. However, we have remained as one people and one nation. We have moved in the last 49 years. We started off as a least developed nation. Today, we have entered the middle income earning nation studies, and we intend in the next 
uh, 20 years to migrate from where we are today to a high income earning nation by 2025. In doing that, we will migrate from being just a raw resource exporter to a manufacturing economy within the next decade. Mr. President, I want to assure you all that all this is being done in total alignment, uh, and we have aligned our development agendas to the uh, United Nations Charter, expressly consistent with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Our aspirations mirror that of this August institution. In fact, in 1975, when we gained independence, our national constitutional eight-point plan directs not just uh, my government today, but government into the future, as it was in the past governments that led my country on our national aspirations to leave no person behind. Uh, Mr. President, our nation's recent 2050 that was launched in 2010 compels governments to develop uh, Papua New Guinea uh, into a top 50 nation uh, by 2050 in terms of human development index. Papua New Guinea looks forward to submitting to the United Nations a full progressive report in July of 2025 at the High Level Political Forum, secondary voluntary national review covering the work we have undertaken thus far amidst the challenges we continue to face and the steps we are taking going forward that will culminate in 2030. Mr. President, if you can indulge me in sharing an insight into managing a diverse multicultural people and what has helped us to blend as one nation, I put to you the role of Christian missionaries and their work that dates back to 1845 when the first Catholic missionaries arrived in my country. In 1975, when we gained independence, Christianity became profound. Uh, consistency with your theme, Christianity in PNG has been the front runner, bearing message of unity, uh, peace, and sustainable coexistence, embracing diversity of cultures, language, and tribes into one human family, living in our natural environment as God has created. Since then, Christian churches have contributed immensely to our country's development through their health and education programs. Uh, real Christianity teaches love, peace, unity, forgiveness, giving meaning to leaving no person behind. Whilst PNG is identified as a Christian nation, Mr. President, I want to assure you and all who are listening that Section 45 of our nation's constitution protects individuals' right to choose and practice of faith and religion. We subscribe strongly to Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. United Nations has been the anchor of this God-given right of humanity. And I offer my country's support to the protection of individuals' choice and rights to practice their faith, and adds that this remains a key duty of United Nations. Mr. President, since the dawn of humanity, history teaches us that many wars have been fought and many lives lost as a result of religious intolerance. We see that happening today. As history is stained with blood of innocent people who have died from state, tribe, or church-sanctioned killings. The United Nations, uh, Mr. President, must condemn laws that encroaches upon individual choice of religion and worship. This is a God-given right. And I see the issue of enforcement of religion upon one another as a threat to peace and coexistence of mankind. I ask the United Nations to keep watch over religious freedom of all people, especially minority people in society where major religions are practiced. Mr. President, the second threat I see facing humanity is poverty, and especially poverty induced by climate change. The pursuit of wealth has caused man to plant the edge of its resources beyond the threshold of sustainability, with little consideration for our children's future. The acceleration of climate change, for instance, is a direct result of mankind's insatiable appetite for resources. An attitude of survival of the fittest, nations and corporations jostle and stampede over each other in order to harvest resources, causing environmental degradation, deforestation, burning of cheaper fossil fuel and pollution, spiraling our planet into climate catastrophes that will further engender poverty. Nations like mine uh, continue, and uh, ocean nations like mine rather, continue to live with the climate change induced sea level rise and weather pattern changes that has now become an accidental threat. That is why we welcome the chair's summary of the high level meeting on sea level rise. Together with other Pacific Island countries, we continue to recognize the 1982 UN Convention on Law of Sea as a legal framework within which all activities in the ocean and seas 
must be carried out. We reaffirm commitment to the Pacific Island Forum Declaration of Continuity of Statehood and the protection of persons in the face of climate change related sea level rise. Last month, the Pacific Island Leaders Forum in Tonga officially recognized these climate change manifestations as existential threat to our Pacific people. We stand united in the support of one or two-led United Nations General Assembly proposal for the inclusion of sea level rise as a standalone agenda in the United Nations General Assembly and other relevant United Nations processes. Mr. President, despite our economic needs, PNG remains committed to safeguarding both our blue ocean life and our green forest life for its children. As a forest nation, PNG continues to play a proactive role to progress our commitments under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement by undertaking adaptations and mitigation effort. However, accessing, accessing of global climate finance continues to be a challenge to Papua New Guinea and many small nations. We call on the United Nations to look into this matter as a sense, with a sense of urgency, or else we can liquidate our forests and marine resources to achieve our development aspirations, especially in a pursuit to alleviate poverty from our people. It is for this reason I speak in solidarity with all forest nations, especially those in the Congo Basin and those in the Amazon Basin, for adequate compensation if we are to preserve our forests, which is in fact the lungs of Earth. Mr. President, Papua New Guinea's vast forest, rich biodiversity, marine life, and indigenous people and cultures are now at the crossroads of great change, either of preservation or loss and extinction. The responsibility to save our environment and planet should bear on all of us in equal measure. It is now up to members of the United Nations to save these forests, which are global assets as I speak. On this note, I want to thank uh, my good friend, His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, President of France, for mobilizing European Union funding for our forest conservation area called Managalas in my country. This is the kind of partnership that should be encouraged. And, and again, I remind the world, the forest of PNG is a global asset. It must be preserved at a price transferable to improving the lives of my forests. You cannot talk about climate change without conversation on forestry. They are the, they are the two sides to the same coin in conversations on climate change. And I call for others out there, especially those who have big carbon footprints, you have to do justice to planet Earth by doing your part, especially assisting us in the preservation of our forests. Mr. President, the third thread facing humanity, in my view, is geopolitical differences and sovereignty contest over territories and people. Increasing geopolitical conflicts and tensions are fueling fragmentation and pro protectionism around the world today. The restrictions on trade, disruptions in supply chains, Growing competitions are crippling our economies. We need to examine peaceful strategies and solutions and invest in peace building initiatives for de escalation, mutual understanding, cooperation, build trust, and foster peaceful relationship. The United Nations role in this must be respected by all nations, for really it was for this reason that the UN was born. So the world does not need to face many more wars again or another big war again. Mr. President, I say this, violence begets violence, and is, and is evil no matter what the justification may be. Violence begets violence. Peace must be achieved by peaceful means. No matter how long or unjust it may seem, peace must be achieved by peaceful means. We live in a time where the press of a button, an atomic or nuclear bomb, has the ability and potential to destroy our planet. All conflicts can resolve, be resolved if we allow United Nations one rule book to take prominence over our own parochial national interest. In PNZ, we partner United Nations in national and subnational peace building efforts. One good example is the de-escalation of our own internal conflict on Bougainville. When the United Nations supervised the Bougainville Peace Agreement in 2001 and continues to ensure we comply with all requirements of that agreement, including bringing the 2019 referendum results to our national parliament. To this day, I am happy to report that no bullets have since been fired in Bougainville. This is the role and the strength of the United Nations, and I call on all nations and people to respect the charter of this institution and the reasons for its existence. 
PNG therefore calls on U the UN and its systems to begin the review of the process to review the Security Council and the reforms that must take place, including removal of veto powers so all nations can sit equally on the table in as far as decision making is concerned. Mr. President, we must do all we can to restore stability to the far reaches of Earth. Global conflicts cause domino effect, and the subsequent impacts are felt throughout the world, including intergenerational wounds. Mr. President, as I conclude, let me remind us again on our collective responsibility to together preserve our planet and our human race. In 1987, our space philosopher called Frank White wrote the o overview effect, a cognitive cognitive shift astronauts experience after viewing planet Earth from the space and upon their return to Earth, he records that most astronauts, if not all, experience a self of self transcendence, appreciating Earth much more and feeling a very strong connection to all people on the planet. And I am sure Neil Armstrong in 1969, on July 20, when he gazed back on planet Earth, standing on moon, he would have looked back and he would not have seen his planet, he would not have seen his country, the United States of America. He would have seen the blue planet, the planet he called home. I call, I call upon all of us, esteemed leaders of this planet, let us adopt a little bit of overview effect to see the world through the eyes of the astronauts. They see the planet from humanity perspective, one planet, one people, one humanity. They appreciated Earth much better. And I want to ask all of us, I want to ask all of us, all leaders of planet Earth, let us appreciate Earth. Let us treasure its life-sustaining gifts. Let us do everything within our means to preserve and protect planet Earth. It starts with all of us, leaders, to think and act correctly because our children's collective future depend on this one. We have but one planet. After all, there's not two planets. You look at the observable universe. You look billions and billions of light years into the observable universe. There is no one planet that looks like us. Only one planet. Let's preserve that. Let us rise above religious bigotry, fight poverty together, and coexist in peace under the charter we ourselves have written into this magnificent institution called the United Nations. I thank you all for the opportunity to speak. May the peace of my Lord Jesus be upon you. Mr. President and all people of Earth, our beautiful life-sustaining Earth, may God bless each and every one of you.